Thank you, everybody, um, for your willingness to spend uh, some time with me tonight. So what I'm going to talk to you about is, as the title suggests, looking at shop fronts in Pompeii. This is a topic that's obviously of interest to me, but you know, I'm going to be looking at it in a sort of broadish sweeping way. Um, but I do hope that it'll be of interest to you. But at the same time, I suppose really what I'm trying to do as well is give you a sense of what life might have been like in the streets of Pompeii. And I think it's sort of moving in some of you who are doing some of the modules at the Open University will have heard aspects of such as like sensory studies and things like that. So perhaps I'm sort of delving a little bit into that. So one of the things that I've talked about in previous um, le lectures about Pompeii is that, you know, an awful lot has been lost as a result of the vagaries of time. Um, and these are just some of the older images of the excavations on the Via di Abadonza. Um, we can see some, obviously these are in black and white, um, but you can see some of the streets. You can see there's obviously color in these streets, which, you know, for any of you who have visited Pompeii in the last several years, even decades, much of this has been lost. But it really is to the credit of these individuals for the work that they've done on uh, Pompeii that we get to see what is there. So much of when we think about Pompeii, we really think about street fronts being much like this. They have um, a lower quadrant, maybe about a meter, meter and a half in red, as it's sometimes, I think Spinzola uses the term, a Pompeian red, and the upper portion of the, the walls themselves are covered in white or painted in white or left exposed. And this is a space often where you find um, graffiti, but this isn't um, really a, a full picture of the color of the streets um, in Pompeii itself. So this it does sort of typify in some ways really what we're looking at when we visit Pompeii nowadays, um, this um, and, um, shop, it doesn't, really, you can see that much of the decoration itself has been lost. But then when you look at some of the older photographs, this is an older photograph coming from, um, what was it, I think in, in um, 1913, you can see that there is coloration here. And what it's in the excavation reports, you can see these are black panels over what we think is, is a red decoration. So in this case, the shop that I pointed out to you a little bit earlier on is this one here. And this is a main domestic dwelling here. So it does seem to, by looking at these, um, this illustration, that given that the coloration of this particular facade is being copied from the shop to the domestic dwelling, that's these two um, dwellings that are associated with each other. In fact, they are connected. So the shop here on the left-hand side, the domestic dwelling on the right-hand side. And this is one of the sort of central decorated areas. So it looks like perhaps that we could use some of this decoration on the street facade to show how the shops were intimately connected to the domestic dwelling. And here we have another example, and this one I think is quite a nice one, so it feels a little bit artistic, looking at um, a shop door and the decoration of the facade through a shop door. And this is the Via de Abadanza. Um, luckily, a portion of it has been preserved, which we can see here. You can see the large open shop door, which is classic means to identify a shop in Pompeii. But adjacent to that, we've got, again, another large um, doorway, which is associated with the domestic dwelling. Unlike the previous slide that I showed you a bit earlier on, you'll see that there's brickwork behind it. This site hasn't actually been fully excavated, so we have no idea the function of what the shop might have been. Although when I say that to you, um, many of the shops, we don't really know what function they actually performed. We can identify them architecturally, but more specifically as to how they were used, we don't know. They would generally be seen as utilitarian space that could have performed multiple functions. So unfortunately, the early excavations, they weren't uh, as refined or as interesting to, in the shop. So we don't know um, what was contained within. But we can see here, it's done a sort of checkboard pattern. And there's a charming um, illustration here to the right hand side. And um, this is coming from the day of Pompeii from Melbourne. Um, of if we go, so I think if we go back slightly here, in this area down here, they did find um, a pot um, which has been 
interpreted as a, a Vespasiani. Vespasiani was basically a piss pot that was used for collecting urine that would be gathered up by fullers and used in the fulling process. So you can see in the upper quadrant of this domestic dwelling and the shop, again, seem to be fairly shared. But, you know, this is showing, again, the coloration. Now, you can see these lower parts here in red, but even still, there is an effort to decorate these in the edges. You can see that there is a clear border. So, again, without knowing that these uh, dwellings and, the sh and retail establishment were connected, the suggestion would be through the facade they were connected. And a, a further example of this, which um, at least in this case, it's been, they've been done some work on this in terms of the illustration, and it makes it much more obvious what I'm trying to suggest to you. So it's not just the bottom part was red, some of them were painted in black, some of them were painted in dark blue, but I think these checkerboard pattern does seem to be reasonably common. Now this is another building that's um, along the, the Via de Abadanza. So the facades themselves would have been quite striking. So the point I was making earlier on, the shop here, and the domestic dwelling here, you know, shared a connection with each other, and they're also sharing the decoration and the facade. And it's just illustrating the point here. You can see the main entrance into the shop and then going into the atrium, and also in this case, the domestic dwelling. So this is just illustrating the point I'm trying to make to you about the shop and the domestic dwelling sharing connections with each other. However, in this case, unfortunately, the um, decoration has been lost. But looking back in the excavator report, it did have a, a checkerboard pattern. But in this case, it was an independent shop. So some, this is something I was still doing a bit more research into. But it is quite possible that the shops themselves that were independent of um, domestic dwellings did make an effort to embellish the wider facade in the front of their, their establishment. And this one's case is quite interesting. It's um, shared next door with uh, Fuller's and between the two of them on the, the, the wall between the two of them, it does seem to be, or it's been suggested there was an advertisement for slaves that were born within one of the shops or in the domestic dwelling because of the Fulonica, the Fuller's place over there to the left was connected to a main dwelling, offering themselves for prices between five and eight asses, which is one of the lower currencies. But this is an interpretation, but it does. One of the points I'm trying to talk to you a little bit about tonight is about advertising. So these seem to be advertising themselves, well, I would think, for work, for menial tasks that they're willing to carry out. The other thing that's important when we're looking at shops, and I think I've sort of indulged myself a little bit too much in this one, is I'm talking about the general facade, the, the masonry elements, the plaster work, but also shop doors. And one of the other classic things I talked to you about um, looking at um, shops is the wide open uh, doorways and how are these closed over? And you will notice on the threshold here, we've got this long groove which is, would have been used to house what we assume to be shop shutters. And in this case, this lower part here would have been used to have a, a doorway, which is sometimes referred to as a night doorway from giving more, more modern parallels that would give access into the shop. But given the circumstance of Pompeii, the evidence for this is, is rather limited. This is perhaps gives you a better illustration of what I'm suggesting to you about that, the night doorway. So looking at this, this would suggest that the doorway would have opened inwards into the shop. So this is how a person would have got into the shop. And a lot of the shops were probably also domestic accommodation for individuals um, that were working within the place. But in other cases, there would have been lock-up shops so people would have locked them from the outside. The other thing that I would suggest is that I've told you that the doorway was covered over by shop shutters. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But maybe the slot was you, the shop shutter would be slid along the, the, the slot here. And this area would have been a, a space open so they could pull the, the, shot, the shutter out and then set it aside somewhere in the shop so it wouldn't be in the way. And another perhaps more interesting example of that, you can see how close the shop shutter would have been to the actual shop counter. And this is probably a little bit more of a skillfully done threshold. 
So we do have some illustrations of what these things might have looked like through plaster casts. And this is a plaster cast and a drawing of a plaster cast that was done in 1861. So you can see what I'm trying to explain to you here about um, what I'd say to you is the night door. You can see there is um, the pivot here allowing it to open up. Um, but we can't really get an illustration as to how the, the, the shutters worked. But it's quite nice in this case, there has been measurements been taken. Unfortunately, this plaster cast itself has been lost. But this is not the only one. Here's another one that's supposed to come from elsewhere in Pompeii. But if you look back over the previous example I showed you, it does seem to be remarkably similar to this one that was done in 1861. This an example was done a bit earlier on. So one of the difficulties when we're dealing with this in Pompeii is trying to trace exactly the whereabouts of where these plaster casts came from. And it's been suggested from the excavation reports, this or one of the other reports, that it came from this area here. Um, but um, I have to admit, I, have, I do have my doubts. So those of you that have been to Pompeii, we've got this very impressive example of the Roman shop shutter. Um, you can see it goes up to quite a substantial height, um, certainly well over my height, perhaps about two metres. Um, this is what I was suggesting to you about being the, the night door. And it does seem to suggest we have a panel here and a panel here. So what I was suggesting is that this door would have been opened up, um, this shutter would have been slid across and taken out. Same with this one, slid across, taken out. And again, exactly the same with this one. So this has given me an opportunity to really try my skill out with them using the pen. So another example of a little bit earlier on, this is Jemina Jeminski, um, one of the earlier excavators of Pompeii. A further one um, dating back to the 1960s, quite nice. Um, but the point what I'm trying to suggest is looking at this next door, we can see another plaster cast of the doorway during the excavation in 1912. But if we look across to the actual shop itself, which I showed you earlier on, we don't see any plaster cast. So it is quite possible that this has been removed, but it does make me a little bit suspicious. The other aspect that makes me quite suspicious is this doorway does seem to be quite different to the illustrations I showed you a bit earlier on. So the illustrations I showed you a bit earlier on, from looking at the supposed location in which these uh, drawings came from and looking at the, the threshold itself, it would suggest the drawing is actually the inside element of it. So that might excuse why this um, doorway looks in the way it does. But if you look closely at this, you can see at the bottom, it's quite um, damaged. The same over here, whilst the upper parts of it look quite pure and untouched, which made me instantly suspicious. And this is something that you notice when you go to it today, is it looks like it's been filled in with polyfiller. So I, I think, and I have seen an illustration of this, but unfortunately I couldn't find this earlier on. And it's one of the things that points I'm trying to make about looking at Pompeii is don't assume what you see today is exactly as it was um, when it was excavated. There is quite a lot of reconstruction that's taken place or consolidation that's taken place. So looking at an earlier illustration, what I found is that this shop door only survived up to this height. And that would explain the previous slide that I showed you earlier on from the actual days of the excavation. So it's not a true likeness of the doorway, but it does give you an impression of the size of what these doorways might have looked like. To get an impression, a further impression, let's move away from Pompeii briefly and move, take a journey over to Herculaneum. And this is the station Herculaneum. And for those of you that's been there, and you can see in this area in V19, what has been preserved here and has been carbonized is part of the lintel of a doorway. So when we're looking at the walls of Pompeii, we have these slots in the threshold, but we don't have the wooden addition of the lintel, which has been lost. So this would also, you can just about see it, but you just have to take my word for it, is that there is a slot here in which the shutter would have been pushed in. A further example of that slot, but also in the upper part, this is again one of the things that people sort of forget when they go to Pompeii, 
a lot of the uh, upper parts, the the the, the upper lintel, um, whatever that's called, um, maybe that is a lintel, they have been reconstructed. So in this case, we have a small part, but again, you can see there is a slot there. So the upper portion above, directly above the threshold would have been made and composed of wood. So it's quite a skillful aspect in which, you know, this, these doors were placed. This again, another example from the, what I showed you a little bit earlier on, you can see where the upper part of the lintel has been preserved. Behind this, there is a shutter, but it's not a shutter from the actual shop front door, which would have been here. So this seems to be a shutter within the dwelling. But you now it does give us a, a bit more additional information as to what these shop doors would have looked like. So let's go back into to Pompeii. And unfortunately, as I said to you a little bit earlier on, some of these uh, plaster casts have been lost. And this is another example of it that's coming from, um, again, on, on the Via de Abadanza. And it's just talking about the bombings in 1943, 1943, where some damage has been taken. So some of you have heard me talk about um, the, the bombings, the Allied bombings of Pompeii at, um, during the Second World War. Um, but what I think is quite interesting, perhaps, that this might have been where there was a, a metal bar went through um, into the side of wall here to hold um, a bolt um, which would have secured the, these um, shutters in place. I'm not sure, but I think there does seem to be one corresponding here. But this might be, I have to admit, my imagination, um, because I've already just talked to you a few minutes earlier on that these were essentially made of wood. But I'm just sort of hypothesizing or present, um, suggesting it might be the case. This is a, a reconstruction that was done um, of the shop shutters um, from the house of the surgeon, which is just heading out towards the Herculaneum gate suggests a more complex form of shutting the door. You can see that um, a sort of like a, um, you know, that musical instrument was, um, that would have allowed it sort of the leaves to fold over each other, which is possible. But, you know, I think this is probably a little bit more complex than is necessary. I know that there has been some of the um, locks and even the bolts that went completely across the threshold to lock the shut doors has been has survived but I don't know about um, these elements but it, as this could have been made out of wood but looking at the thresholds they don't seem to be as um, sharp shall we say to um, keep these shutter these shutters in place I would imagine there'd be an awful lot of wear so I think it seems to be much more economical that they would have been just slid out and removed and we do see this in other parts of the world where um in early but I have you know I, I don't I did many years ago I went to um Korea I could see they were actually using shutters in a similar uh, method I've just described but not all these um shop doors had shutters. This is another one that's been preserved in um, a plaster cast. And this has been identified as a shop, but doesn't have a shuttering mechanism. So I did say a little bit earlier on that, you know, it's one of the easiest ways to identify a shop. So it's this wide open shop door. But in this case, you know, this is just seems to be a normal type of shop door or a normal type of domestic dwelling door. This, Again, how it's been preserved. And this is the rear part of it. Unfortunately, um, whatever technique they actually used, um, the plastic cast technique, it just preserved the face of it rather than the back of it, which I think is quite interesting. Now, this just gives us an indication of trying to think about, you know, give you a bit more of an impression of, you know, we talked about that sensory studies I mentioned a little bit earlier on, but we can really only get that either through imagination by looking at the archaeological remains or looking at some of the literary sources. Naturally, and when we're looking at Pompeii, we've got very limited in terms of uh, the literary sources, but you can see this a description of Juvenal as he's walking through the streets at night in the city of Rome. He's talking about, you know, the chains are used to, to shop, lock up houses and shops. You know, it certainly gives an impression that the streets would have been quite dark when um, the streets themselves were covered over.
Another example here from Horace talking about, you know, I mentioned a little bit about those uh, shut up shops. Um, this individual um, who was originally a barber um, got tired of his trade and left it and shut his shop up and went to Rome and learned how to become a lawyer and um, seemed to have been very successful in relation to that. Um, and a little bit more dramatic, it does, this gives an impression of that the, you know, it, th these shutters themselves were um, quite proficient in what they needed to do to try and protect stock within, and the stock was stored within the shop because Nero and his um, uh, uh, nocturnal exploits would sometimes break into shops, you know, with the, with an axe, and sometimes with individuals to help him out and rob shops, and um, as it says here, you know, set up a market in the palace and sell these things off. So, admittedly, these are um, literary sources are coming from uh, central Italy and, and Rome itself and not from Pompeii. But perhaps it gives us a better indication as to, you know, so, as I said to you a bit about that sensory idea of looking at um, the, the, the archaeological remains in Pompeii. Now, I have talked to you quite a bit about looking at the, the decoration of the wider facade. This is an example of a shop front in um, Naples. So you can see the graffiti on the left and the right hand side of the shop, but also the shutter itself seems to have been smeared and decorated with the graffiti. Now, this kind of roller blinds themselves that have been quite frequent, we, we associate with shops nowadays and are are, are noisy themselves opening and closing. I think go back into the 1830s when they start to were introduced. So possibly, I know it's a modern parallel, that maybe some of these shop shutters would have been, um, been victims of the graffiti um, that we see along the streets of Pompeii. We do know that some of these um, advertisements for gladiatorial games or political campaign um, slogans um, on, on the walls themselves, they might also have been plastered on shop doors. But one point is that we know that sometimes these were done at night. Perhaps also maybe the shop shutter would have been decorated as a main means of promotion for the shop. Unfortunately, given the evidence we've got, this, we don't know, but I'm sort of just making a suggestion a little bit towards that. The other area um, of interest and perhaps even promotion of a shop would have been the shop counter. Now, these themselves were also decorated, and this would have been obviously um, very clear once the actual shop had been open. And this is, you know, one of the, the clear means of decor of um, identification of the activities that are taking place within. Now, in this case, this is um, the um, a, a tavern um, quite close to um, the, the main brothel in Pompeii, but you can see the upper part of it is decorated um, in marble, which gives a sort of a little bit of a fancy indicate um, a, a fancy sort of look. The lower part here seems to be quite rudimentary. Now, looking at this, we can see the upper part, uh, the marble surface does seem to be quite perfect. Some of these have been reconstructed, but they do seem to be reconstructing what exactly what existed there beforehand. But it does seem that an awful lot of the front of these counters were plastered, some of them quite plainly, sometimes in a red color, sometimes in white, but other ones were decorated. So clearly the person within these um, retail establishments wanted to draw attention to the establishment, not just um, the activities within, but make these much more personal. And moving it beyond, shall we say, the, the, um, the in, what I've said to you a little bit, the connection between the domestic dwellings and um, the shops, but making the shop much more interesting itself. This one I showed you a little bit earlier on. Um, but this, I said to you know about the, the independent shop, the wider facade been decorated in a checkerboard pattern. But in this case, the front of the, the face of the actual counter itself was decorated, as has been described um, in 1879, of a hunting scene. So you can quickly read through that in some, some of the details that are there. It's been described as being, you know, sort of quite rudimentary, but it was already going into decay by the time it was excavated. So perhaps this is one of those shops that have been exposed to the elements, have been run by one individual for quite a long period of time that hadn't updated um, the, the frontage of, of the shop counter, perhaps. But looking at the description here, you can see it was quite complex with several different animals been depicted and several different activities been depicted. <laughs> 
but it does show the importance um, of going back over the original excavation reports and the early excavations. Other counters themselves seem to be fully embellished in this marble element. Now, a lot of this marble itself were not uh, cut for purpose of um, shop counters, like they might have been nowadays, or if you think about your own kitchen, but they were made up of, of uh, recycled marble. This one's quite nice because it does give a good illustration of um, individuals having lunch again, Jasemski here, um, with other individuals, I think it's her husband over on the left-hand side. Um, it gives you height, an idea of the height of these of these shop counters. But it does look quite a grand shop counter. This one I've showed in a, an earlier talk that I've given, you know, with the marble decorations, it does look quite impressive. And it would certainly draw your attention to it and maybe give the, the shop itself a, an, an aspect of class or an atmosphere of class. A further example, again, going back into the Via de Abadan, so you can see this is quite an impressive effort they've made into in terms of the decoration of the face of this shop counter. This one here, again, going back into what I said to you a little bit earlier on about the basic element. Um, this shop front does seem to have been plastered in the front, but why I wanted to show this is this is an engraving from 1775. We've got three little figures that have been stuck into the shop counter, which certainly made it very distinct looking at this um, shop counter. Now, I know from early reports that several of these were um, stolen, but now um, obviously completely lost. But what we see, as I said to you earlier on, what we see today is a necessary reflection of what the shop counters would have looked like during the earlier time when they were excavated. So going back to the point that I said to you a little bit earlier on about, you know, the paint decoration, here's another example, quite a, an interesting floral decoration that we see here. You can see how that is uh, nowadays, but a reconstruction of what it might have looked like closer to the original excavation time and hopefully uh, suggestion from that as to how it was when um, it was in use. This is a close-up of it. You can see it's quite a rudimentary um, decoration, but to me, you know, it's obviously better than what I could do, but it looks to, uh, to me to be very impressive. And certainly it's one of my favorite counters um, in Pompeii. Well, it used to be until the, the more recent one has been excavated. Now, what is also further interesting is most people don't necessarily look at the side. And this is something that people would have seen as they're walking up the street, is you can see there does seem to be um, a feline here. Um, I would think it's a black panther, but um, I, I, don't, I don't know enough about these things. But they have made an effort to decorate this counter, as people have suggested, walking up the Via de Abadanza up towards the Forum. So the decoration I showed a bit earlier on would have been people sort of walking straight towards the actual shop, but they are trying to take account of what people would see as they progress down the street. Another further illustration of this um, painted decoration on a shop counter, you can see what seems to be some sort of a shield um, or maybe even a trophy, a large um, vessel over here and a, lar uh, a vessel over here. So they have made quite an effort to make this shop counter quite striking. It could be suggested that perhaps some of these um, images here have something to do with what took place within this establishment, but as I said, unfortunately, we don't know. This is obviously uh, the illustration over the le left hand side is quite an early one, quite impressed with the flares that were worn. And I do remember these push chairs myself because not that I remember being pushed around in one of them, but I do remember them. Um, my brothers, one sisters, when they're doing. But I mentioned to you a little bit earlier on about um, the more recent excavations that have taken place. And this is a shop count that's been just uncovered in the last five to six years. And you can see the vividness of the decoration of the shop counter. And, you know, for me personally, I'm always in awe every time I look at this, how impressive this is. Now, the shop counters I've shown, most of the shop counters I showed you are on the Via de Abadanza, which is considered to be the main street in Pompeii. This is one of the back streets. And you can see they have spent quite an effort to try and decorate this one. You can see um, a nymph or a goddess um, um, illustrated here as the, the main sort of illustration they're trying to make across. This might have had something to do with the name of the shop. I don't know. You can think about, you know, 
modern day or reasonably modern day pubs where they have um and it is you know like the queen's head of a, an image of the, the queen's head on it you know it's trying to make an association with the actual premises other aspects of it is this may be some sort of illustration of a counter you can see various vessels on top maybe perhaps this was a wine shop you can see the amphorae here but i think it's quite nice you've got objects that have been suspended from the roof none of which unfortunately survives um, from the likes of pompeii but Perhaps that was something that did exist when the shop was in, in action, in activity. When it's been excavated, these would have been lost or they would have been just considered as um, loose items. Um, but maybe nowadays, you know, with modern excavation techniques, if they were doing things from the very beginning, they would notice these things. And again, looking towards the side, you can see various fowl, but what the one aspect that I particularly like. Um, and you can see maybe this is some sort of live cockerel that might have been there. I don't know, but what I think is, is interesting to contrast with the, these dead birds over here onto the side. So we do know from looking inside the various dolia here that it did contain various different types of stew. Some of these stews, I think, contain pork. Um, it does seem to contain, I think, chicken and snails. Um, an interesting combination of items. But, you know, we're still sort of waiting on what the, the, the real analysis and further analysis of this is. But what I quite like is that, you know, we have an example here of a, a charming dog with a, it's a, uh, a leash on it and collar, which you know seems to be some sort of guardian of the actual establishment. Gr scratched up on the lower part, this is where we have um, the charming thing about describing somebody as a shameless individual, shall we say. So a pork and fish combination, which sounds sort of quite interesting, a concoction of snails, fish and sheep. I don't think there is any I, indication about um, chicken or fowl, but I don't see why not. But, you know, this is what has actually been found on the actual site itself. But it is an interesting counter, particularly in the shape that it takes place. But the point I'm trying to make tonight is the decoration and the vibrancy of the colour. So I talked a little bit earlier on about the colour as it existed on the wider facade. So we're only getting a very faded view as to what these establishments might have looked like when they were, um, shall we say, fully active in terms of their retelling and um, workshop activity. Other aspect we tend to forget when we're walking through the streets of Pompeii, you sometimes assume that these were all just one um, storied dwellings when they didn't. Most, a lot of these buildings were two stories and you can see these balconies here. Shouldn't really necessarily have to point them out to you, um, but these are reconstru reconstructed. So unfortunately, an awful lot of the balconies when they're being excavated were just sort of cut through when they're doing the excavation, just chasing the main wall behind. But at least in some cases, we have an indication as to what they look like. Over here, we have a plaster cast of one of the um, piece of wood coming out. We can see these slots here that indicate there was a balcony upwards. We can use these slots also in other, in the interior of the dwellings to show that there was an upper floor. And this is the plaster cast that you know, we can see nowadays, which doesn't look as impressive when I'm showing it this way, but it is something, as I say, to be cautious about and thinking about is that there would have been balconies. And the point I really want to sort of make about balconies is it would have offered some measure of shelter and comfort to um, those that were going into the shops, perhaps even those that are working into the shops. Um, if we're thinking about the British climate, obviously from rain, but in the Mediterranean climate and Pompeii, does would have given a bit more shelter and shade for the individuals. The other thing is I've talked about, you know, masonry uh, shop counters. There is a suggestion that, or you could be suggest that some of these um, shop counters are also composed out of wood. There are some frescoes that do seem to suggest that, but in the original excavation report for this um, individual dwelling, um, uh, again on the Via de Abadanza, um, it has been suggested there would have been a wooden counter over in this area. Now, the indication of that is the void here. A, a better illustration of it is there. and in this space here. So 
the original excavators thought that this would have been where there was a wood encounter, which does seem to be um, quite possible in my mind. And there is suggestion that there was a, a wood encounter that was carbonized in Herculaneum. Unfortunately, it's difficult to see what that counter looks like nowadays um, because it's not really very accessible. But like the actual um, shutters for the, the shop front, it is possible maybe these wooden counters were not just left bare wood, but they too might have been decorated. Now, some of you might be asking, what are these holes here? Now, it's possible that these would have been for supporting shelves, and this would have been where there might have been a, a domestic shrine inside the actual shop, just to, as a bit of an aside. Now, I've been talking a little bit about, you know, the decoration, but I want to try and give you some sort of flavor of the color and um, activity and um, the, the buzz of the streets. And this is look, um, this is a, a bakery. And if you look um, towards the side of the bakery here, that this is the bakery main entrance, uh, you can see there's a, a, de a bench and a further bench over here. So this is, one of the main doors into the bakery itself, a further door into the bakery. So it does seem that perhaps that you could make your purchase within this bakery, a better illustration of the, um, the bench and the exterior, and could have taken out your bread or I don't know what the equivalent might be of a donut or something like that, and sit in the street and enjoy your meal out there. So it's not just that people would have um, stood at the shop counter and making their purchase. Going back into the illustration I showed you earlier on the very colorful, more recent excavated, this does seem to be like a takeaway shop, um, a takeaway premises where you could buy food and perhaps eat at the actual counter itself. So the streets and around the shop front could have been a hub of, of activity of crowds of individuals and people would have spent time standing outside. A further example of this, um, another um, bakery, is this one over here. Now, this one, you can see an earlier photograph that's, took, that's been taken, and this is how it has been cleaned up. So when you are trying to do uh, research into um, these um, benches, you can see that quite a number of them have been made um, shall we say, easier to identify. So we do need to be a little bit cautious of that. But at least in these two bakeries, an effort was on the exterior, this is just to prove that this was a bakery. This is where the milling stones existed. And behind this, you can see the counter, or not the counter, the oven. So again, perhaps you could have made your purchase inside and sat outside waiting. Now, these benches are, I think, are, are interesting, the main reason why I think they're interesting because it does tend to be associated with um, domestic dwellings and it's often suggests that it's part of the salutatio. The salutatio is part of the patron client um, activities where the clients would wait outside the domestic dwelling, waiting until the main doors were open and they'll go inside and meet their patron, the master of the house, and will ask for various different things or talk to them and the master of the house will sort of give them advice or give them money and things like that. So not all these benches in front of domestic dwellings might have been for or associated with the salutatio. It might have just been part of the street uh, front activity of people just sitting down, sitting in the shade, enjoying the street life, perhaps. This is another further example, not of a bakery. And unfortunately, we don't necessarily, this, it's been suggested that, you know, it's been some sort of um, uh, a tavern, perhaps. Um, we have another counter over here, and I will talk about this um, shop a little bit later on as well. So it's not just bakeries that are associated, they're also associated with uh, different types of shops. A closer indication of what it was like before, a little bit uh, earlier image of that. Um, in this case, it might perhaps have been a bench that was shared with a domestic dwelling here. So it does illustrate the point I said to you a little bit earlier about the salutatio. I'm not trying to say that they weren't associated with the salutatio and domestic dwellings, but this sort of just gives the impression the bench has just had that singular purpose. I think it's much more complex. And as I said, it, it does seem to be part of that st street life, so to speak. 
Another nice illustration of the, the shop um, bench is this one here, again, in front of a, a tavern um, or a bar. Um, in this case, uh, a little bit of a close up of it, you can see it's been nicely tiled. So certainly some work has been done on this to make it look pretty for um, the respective tourists that are visiting Pompeii. And this is how it looked like when it was closer to someone who was originally excavated in 1917. So you can see that this, in this case, was plastered and it seems to be coloured in a red colour that was similar to the lower part of the, um, the, the shop front. So again, goes back to the point that you do need to be a little bit cautious about what you do see in modern day Pompeii. This one, I already showed you this shop counter, um, the one I mentioned a bit to you about the trophy. And what we see here does seem to be another um, bench. And this will be quite useful because, you know, the, the Via de Abadanza, we're assuming, will be quite a busy street. So rather than having the bench in the sh in, on the street itself, they put it down on these side streets. This is one of those interesting side streets which I don't quite understand because it does seem to be connected to the adjacent insula next door to it. But um, that's, that's probably... A, a topic for another um, lecture. Um, but again, trying saying that you need to be a bit cautious. You can see that it has been quite um, heavily reconstructed. And given that we've got this um, sort of slight roofing, it does show that the original excavators are quite close, just after the original excavation, they're trying to preserve the decoration that was on the wall. And this is 1976. And this is what was on the wall you can see these large serpents. So this so-called bench may not have been, a so, been there for um, the shop purpose, but might have been associated with what looks like um, a street shrine. So it may have been used, as I said, you know, just for um, relaxation activities, but perhaps the original purpose when it was built was for um, this uh, street shine. So it's, again, just some things that we need to think about. In case you're wondering what I'm trying to illustrate above, you can just see some of the serpent coils here and various elements of the, the serpent's coil here. What has been preserved in, in, in modern day Pompeii. Other counters seem to be quite rudimentary, or not counters, other benches seem to be quite rudimentary. And this one just seems to be like almost on a step pattern. Whether it was um, a bench, I'm not entirely sure. But again, one of those things we do need to be cautious about, an awful lot of stuff was moved around when they were doing the original excavations. So some things might have been put in a place where they, they shouldn't necessarily be. And this is even a worse example of it here what has been identified as a bench just outside the shop. It just seems to be a pile of rubble to me that's been dumped on top um, what might have been a bench. However, this one is, I've already showed you a little bit earlier on, this shop counter. This is the one that I said to you had the, the three little faces embellishments there. Um, obviously, we're done better in the original drawing, but you can see there's a bench here on the side of it. Now, this bench, I think, is particularly interesting because it's L-shaped. It also seems to take up much of the pavement. And this is one of the walkways through um, the um, Herculaneum Gate. Another illustration of that bench here and the entrance that I was suggesting to you a little bit earlier on. So you could imagine you would make your purchase over here and then you sit down here and indulge yourself, watch the people moving in and out of Pompeii through the Herculaneum Gate. This is a little bit further up the street, which seems to be in this area here. It's not very clear, I admit, from the engraving, but a further bench. And like the previous one, it's the opposite side of where the shop counter is. I don't think it is something that shares the domestic dwelling here because you can see a gap in the wall. So it is taking advantage of, of the space here. So it does seem that at least the, through the Herculaneum gate, there are two shops in quite close proximity to each other that have been identified as being taverns or in some sort of, shall we say, takeaway store, um, quite close to Herculaneum gate where people could sit down and 
it also perhaps suggests that some limitation of the amount of space within the, the shop and it's, it's spilling out onto um, the, the pavement in front of the actual shops itself. This is a nicer illustration of it, um, 1937. And I took just a, a view down through the Herculean gate. This is the earlier bench I showed you in house shop number two, I think it is. And this one is number five. So this is the full exposure of the Herculaneum gate. Now, some of you be thinking, well, no, this is going to block the way. Now, again, exploring through literary source that exists. This is from the, the Justinian uh, legal texts, which are dating back in, not well, forward, shall we say, into the sixth century AD, so quite old. But this individual um, who's, who's writing, um, uh, this, the, 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 this is not the Justinian one, this is um, the, uh, the, the Julian law codes from the 44 BC. Um, this is just talking about Rome, the Rome itself. You can see about the importance of respecting public areas within a, Rome itself and a mile outside Rome, that no one shall build any structures or erect anything in any of the arcades or any of the pavements. Um, you can only do that if you get permission. So it's not just Rome. We've got a charter from Urso, which is in Spain. Again, talking about respecting uh, public roads and footpaths. Uh, footpaths. But this is where I was going to in the Justinian edicts. Um, and this again, talking about, you know, respecting public streets and anything done therein. Now, Papinias, um, he's a, a legal writer that's much earlier than the Justinian one. This is looking at the second century AD. So he is dealing with codes that existed before him. So perhaps, I'm not sure entirely about these Justinian law codes, but this might be more universal in, in um, certainly the Italian peninsula, but elsewhere in the Roman Empire, perhaps. But again, it's making point that, you know, you need to keep um, the shop fronts in these areas or the pavements themselves um, free of any sort of clutter. And it's taught much, you know, you're not allowed to dig holes in the streets or in the pavements, but you can see the different treatment that they would give if it was a, a, um, done by a slave, they would get beaten up. If it was somebody who was a freed person, they'd be fined. And a further one lower down is there are some individuals that were allowed to invade the pavement space, probably because of the limited space within the actual shop dwellings themselves. So in this case, a fuller was allowed to dry clothing outside or a carriage maker, because when I talk about, you know, carriage makers uh, fixing wheels and things like that. So they would have been allowed to use the pavement and maybe store stuff out on the pavement, but they must not interfere with the, the people moving up and down the footpath or, or with traffic. So I've talked sort of quite broadly about street life and talk something a little bit more closer to what I'm trying to suggest in terms of advertising. Um, now, when you talk about advertising in the Roman period, you know, you often get sort of a, um, accused of being sort of anachronistic and being modernistic. Um, but looking at the, the origin of the word advertising, and it does seem to go back into the Latin term about moving, to, turning towards, so getting a person's attention. Now, we're thinking about more, modern forms of advertising we're thinking about you know publicizing information and um, making more what's known certainly much more dramatic but really what i'm sort of interested in, in terms of looking at the roman period is looking at the actual shop identity not necessarily indicating a service and things like that it might have been some aspects of that but you no know, there doesn't seem to be any anything indi indicative um, in terms of looking at the archaeological evidence but certainly you know any form of visual display is a form of advertising. That's really what I'm going to talk about now. The purpose of that is obviously, as listed here, about getting people into the shop, the taverna, um, making purchases, but also you know getting people to talk about the shop and, and trying to return to that shop. So the promotion and the decorated facades in Pompeii, to me, show there was quite a vibrancy in terms of retailing activity. They are trying to get first-time customers into their premises. That's what they're doing. That's what the purpose of the decoration. If you know the shop, okay, I know some of this might help with the identification. If anyone who's visited Pompeii, it's quite easy to get a bit lost. But, you know, I do think it's really try and get the attention of first-time customers. So looking at these issues of display, again, retreating back into um, the, the literary source. And this is more about 
broadly about the display aspect. Now, I think this is quite a nice story that's coming from Pliny, and he talks about bird droppings in the stock of, of uh, shoes in the front of a, of, of a taverna a shop, of a shop. It illustrates to me that shop counters would have been used to display items. So when we, again, when we look at Pompeii, we see all these shop counters been quite clear of, of, of items. When they were an active retail establishment, they would have been used to display certain elements of stock. It's not just the actual counters, but the um, door fronts, the, the, the lintel or the sides of the doorways, again, also been used. Now, here's a charming illustration coming from Horace, where he talks about, you know, no stalls hold his book because people were able to touch and have access similar to the bird droppings. They're able to hit into the cobblers. But the point I was saying to you about the doorposts been used for advertisement coming from Marshall. So there would have been pinning sort of pages from one of the books. So Again, this is something that might have been used in Pompeii, but the archaeological evidence, unfortunately, is not there. What we do have is certain illustrations such as this. This is outside um, the, the, the back end or one of the sides of what is the modern restaurant in Pompeii, which converted to some of these taverns. Sometimes suggests that this might have been a, a milk cellar. It looks like a goat. Another example over here um, of two individuals carrying an amphorae. Um, again, the suggestion being, because it's very little within the actual shop that that's we, we, we know of, um, might have been a, um, a wine shop or it might have been porters, people that carried items. Again, we don't know. Um, but the, these would have been a permanent element of display within the front of these particular shops. So you could... I made a point a little bit earlier on about these being utilitarian space, and I don't think that these shops would have, been the, have the same activity in them for a long period of time. Some of them could have changed hands and changed with the change of hands, change over in terms of the activities within, just like a modern day shop. They, these stuff more figurative ones, other, shall we say, interesting ones is phalli are used outside some of the shops. This example here is, um, positioned over here but this is a shop and this one seems to be some sort of domestic dwelling so it's located over here now unfortunately you can see it's got quite weathered away but there are a number of um shops or even that do seem to have these phalli outside another shop here uh, a further example this is going out to um the the, the sea gate um, in, in Pompeii um, between two different um, shops. So this different phalli, so you've got the figurative one, but also you've got these geometric patterns. What these mean, we don't really know. And there has been various suggestions that have been made. Uh, Roger Ling did a study of it, and this is um, plotting these on the map of Pompeii. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything very obvious about it. Um, they do seem to be, for the most part, associated with shops. But to me, they just seem to be things that are more uh, an aspect of identification in particular streets. They don't seem to indicate um, what I was suggesting earlier on, the activities that are taking place within. Certainly, the figurative ones could be argued, but I doubt it given the geometric pattern, but also given the various phalli that are there. Now, the phalli is associated with um, luck. So perhaps that might be luck in general for that particular insula or particular um, shop it was associated with. But again, going back to the point I said to you about it's a utilitarian space that could have changed use uh, quite rapidly. So what I think is more interesting is the individualization. I talked about shop counters been used to individualize shops. Um, in this case, we do seem to have shop signs. Now, going back into what we have today and closer to what it would look like um, during the time when it was um, originally excavated. Now, this I admit it's 1965. This was excavated in 1912, uh, I think it was. And they have removed an awful lot of these because you can imagine the rigors of time, a lot of these things are going to be destroyed. Now, this is quite nice. Um, it has 
when you read about it originally, it gets quite, gets quite exciting because it almost looks like it's some sort of shop logo or some sort of shop statement. The Phoenix is lucky, may you be too. Almost sort of sounds like something that you imagine Nike would pr present to you. But looking at it in the original context, you can see it's quite small. The main aspect of this is the Phoenix. And this does seem to be what we normally seem to be like in... Um, modern day pubs or shall we say the decoration that you associate with those another sort of interesting decoration is the placement of those as look going back into the previous one it's just right to the side of the shop in this case you've got them taking advantage of people moving away from the forum going down the Via de Abadanza and this is something that's really very much going to be in your face so this is associated with this shop here unfortunately the shop itself hasn't been excavated so we don't know but it's assumed that this would have been something to do with pottery this again just illustrating the point that they have taken advantage of the odd way in which this street itself has been composed and you can see there's another individual over here trying to take a selfie in that shop um, so shops are just, I'm not the only one who just likes shops. A closer up of the, the actual sh uh, shop sign, you can see an awful lot of these shop signs are in their own, shall we say, um, red band frame, which I think is quite interesting. Now, it has been identified as the shop of, of the vases. I don't know, this might have been a vase maker, a vase decorator, or it might have been something that was... Um, within the actual vase, vases. The thing is, we just don't know because the shop itself hasn't been excavated. Another sort of look at the shop itself, and going back to the point is that if, if you go through Pompeii now, you can see, unfortunately, it has been removed. So if we skip along to Herculaneum again, you have this um, outside the, the, the Casa del Salone Nero, you have an interesting figurative decoration here. But what I want to draw attention to are these vases there. Now, these vases here, um, it would you would think that they are associated with this figurative element here. Now, what I think is interesting is this figure is clearly looking into the domestic dwelling. So I think, and I mentioned to you a bit earlier on about the the red frame, I think this is associated with the shop here. Both of them aren't. I just think it's a bit odd that you would have this impressive decoration here and not have it facing towards the shop. I will show you some other figure to ones, but you can see the figure tends to be facing towards the doorway of the shop. The other thing that I think is quite interesting about that's something I didn't know until reasonably recently, this was removed and replaced relatively recently, as in the last uh, 30, 40 years. You can see it just goes slightly over um, the side of the doorway here. So again, just something to be cautious about when you're looking at the streets in uh, Beau Pompeii and Herculaneum. What is interesting about this is you've got vases um, or whatever you like to call them, of different colours. They do seem to be glass, at least it looks like to me, the liquid um, inside, and has these um, indicators here that has been suggested as a price listing. So this might be the price of different types of wine, perhaps, but it's just suggesting, unfortunately, the excavation of the shop hasn't uh, given indication as to what might have been the contents within. So it might have been something to do with the distribution of wine, perhaps. Um, the other thing is, going back to the point I said to you about the, the, the shops themselves might have changed their purpose. Perhaps the shop did change a purpose and they just left the shop sign here. Um, perhaps, I don't know. It's just something again to be thinking about when we're looking at um, the fresco, but it's much easier to change and convert a fresco rather than um, the embellishment that I showed to you about the figurative elements I showed a bit earlier on. Now, going back over, talking about the figurative aspect, again, I showed you this shop counter earlier on, which this area is where we have a figure or a bust that has been identified as being Roma. I'm making the point that I suggested to you earlier on, she is looking in towards the shop itself. And it is clearly associated with this particular shop. It's in close proximity to it. This is how she looked um, in 1914. So it would have been quite a dramatic thing. It's just 
when you see the original excavation um, illustrations or photographs, it just shows, you know, unfortunately how much has actually been lost. So why uh, Rama, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, the shop showing some sort of allegiance to Rama, but, you know, we don't really know if this is Rama, but you no, know, it does seem to be some sort of deity, mythological deity that's been associated with the shop itself. Further example, now this is probably something that I would be doing, but luckily I didn't take the picture um, of myself doing it, but I want you to look at this area here. Now, again, aspects have been lost. I showed you this illustration a bit earlier on about the decorative wider front, but in this case, unfortunately, the image is not great, but this has been identified as being Venus, and not just Venus, a uh, Venus of Pompeii. Venus of Pompeii is the patron um, deity of Pompeii itself after it was a, became a colony to, uh, from Sulla. So maybe they're showing some form of allegiance to that earlier period. I don't know, but maybe they just had a particular affinity to uh, Venus. I don't know. Further illustrating what has been lost. This doesn't look like a very impressive shop. You can see it's been blocked up, hasn't been fully excavated. But if you look at the early excavation, what we have here is Dionysus and Mercury. Certainly Mercury would we would associate it with commerce. Um, and there seems to be several illustrations of Mercury, not just with uh, shops, but also with domestic dwellings. And this illustration here, of course, you can't quite see him, but he does have a money bag. I think I've shown another image of it too. Um, the money bag here, but it's clearly identified as being uh, Mercury looking in towards the shop. Dionysus with uh, the Black Panther that's associated with him. Again, looking in towards the shop. And this would have been, I would imagine, quite a dramatic um, facade with these two deities, probably protective deities of um, the shop itself. It's not just um, immediate deities. Other aspects of mythology are also associated. In this case, we've got um, Daedalus. Um, this sometimes suggests that it might be part of a, um, a guild for carpenters. We don't know. But this is Daedalus killing, after he's killed his nephew that he got jealous of. Um, it's taking place. And this is Daedalus um, who um, created... Um, a mechanical or a wooden bull for um, the queen of Crete. Um, and ultimately she gave birth to um, um, the Minotaur. So this shop seems to be associating itself um, quite closely with um, this creative aspect and, it, and, um, and, and this particular myth, which is quite interesting. Now, I do need to air a certain word of caution. The um, the guild aspect may be over here. The Daedalus element um, with um, the Queen of Crete might be over here and associated with this domestic dwelling. But going back to the illustration itself, it does seem to be much more associated in terms of how they are looking at the actual shop. But, you know, I'm talking about shops tonight, so that's what I'm going to focus on tonight. A further interesting one is this particular shop, which is moving away from the Via de Abadans and quite over to the other side of um, Pompeii and closer to the Forum, is this one has been identified as a shop or Lupinar, which is a brothel based upon this illustration here. Now, what we see here is some sort of deity, perhaps suggested to be um, a victory. We have a donkey and a lion. Um, what's below this is a, a scratching of um, gladiatorial games, but why it's been suggested that it's um, a Lupinar is because you can see, if you look quite closely at this etching, that um, the donkey, to use the term, I think is, is covering, so to speak, I think that's a, the equine term that one would use, um, the lion. Now, why they would want to have this in this particular shop, I don't know. But on to the right of this was an illustration of Bacchus, and to the left was an illustration of Mercury. This illustration itself came from this central area here. There has been some interpretation of this might have been something about being anti-Mark anti Anthony. I don't know, but it just seems to be very early for that. But 
why I want to show this to you is if you're looking over towards the left that what has been preserved, it's, it's not very clear. And one of the reasons why it's not very clear is because it was whitewashed over. So the point I'm trying to make here is that shop signs were changed. So this would suggest me based upon what I admit is this singular example here is that if somebody changed hands in a particular shop, they would have changed the actual shop sign itself. Again, I've showed you this one a little bit earlier on, um, and I talked about the, the decor, this area been decorated with some sort of um, fresco, but we do have um, that has an inscription associated with this. In this case, it has Sitius restored the elephant. Now, what this means, we don't know, but interpretation of this is that Sitius is not the owner of the actual premises, although it has been suggested because, you know, it's in the further advertisement about, you know, th uh, a triclinio, three shops, you know, to, 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 to rent, is that Sitius might have been the artist that did the shop sign. So I think that's quite interesting because we're getting a little bit of a view of the artist who decorated shops. So that leads me to um, probably one of the most impressive shop um, facades in, in Pompeii, the one of the, the four deities. And you can see the four deities obviously up here above. We have as Apollo, um, Jupiter, um, Mercury, and I think Artemis here. This is quite an impressive facade, not just um, of the four deities in the top part. Uh, this one has been excavated. What we see here is another illustration of Venus. Again, not just Venus, Venus, but Venus of Pompeii. You can see being framed again in red to make it very clear. It's not just part of the wider facade. Another element that I think is quite interesting, it's not very clear in the other illustrations I've looked at, is association with Cibele um, and the worship of Cibele. And just over here into the side is an image of Dionysus. So it seems to be quite an eclectic variety of deities that is associated with this particular shop. Again, unfortunately, the shop hasn't been excavated. So we don't know what activities took place within, but we are assuming that this has something to do with the identity of the people that either own the shop or the people that um, uh, worked in the shop. Now, moving back into the, um, the actual four deities themselves, again, you can see that they haven't removed quite a lot of them, but looking at these four deities that it's named after, and going back to the point I said to you about the actual particular artists, it seems that the artist who did the shop facades, in some ways it might seem naturally enough, but there wasn't any sort of snobbery in between, you know, doing the decoration of domestic dwelling and doing shop fronts. That does seem to be associated with this particular um, house, domestic dwelling in um, Region 7, which is not too far away, of these images in this particular room. You can see Mercury here, and this is Apollo. And if we link them up, you can see these are three individuals I'm talking about. Mercury here, Artemis, that has been identified as Artemis, and Apollo. And if we link those in to the shop area, they do seem to be reasonably similar to each other. Now, I admit I'm not an expert in looking at frescoes, but, you know, I think quite like this uh, linkage between the interior decoration of domestic dwellings and the exterior decorations of shops. So I've given you sort of what I'd like to think is a reasonable quick, uh, quick run through, although I appreciate it, I've gone talked about over an hour. This is again in a modern um, street in Naples, admittedly, you know, in the evening, but it does give you an indication as to the color of the actual uh, streets in modern Naples. And I'm suggesting that something quite similar would have existed in Pompeii. And probably a lot of the color might have been from items that were within the dwelling or within the shop and taken outside as form of display. But I think at this stage, you know, when, if you, when you do visit Pompeii or the likes of Herculaneum or consider some of the streets of um, other parts of the Roman Empire, there was an awful lot more activity that's taking place in the streets and an awful lot more color in the streets than we naturally would associate from looking at um, what has been preserved for us today.
So thank you very much for your patience and, and for listening to me, to, to me tonight. Um, most of the illustrations I've used tonight have been taken from Jack and Bob Dunn's uh, Pompeii and Pictures because of obviously restrictions in terms of travel, um, but they've been very useful, but also have taken some illustrations from um, the web. I'd also like to thank um, the LRAC Arts and Humanities Society, but in particular Cheryl, who's um, been looking after me tonight. But if you have any questions, I'll, I'll let Cheryl answer them all. And no, I'll... oh dear. No, no, no. We do have a couple of questions. So, Dave... Two. That's good. Well, no, I've got two. Well, I always have questions. David Sinclair has asked, were, uh, what were the locks on the shop doors like? Did they have any keys in the modern sense? Um, I, I was trying to find an illustration of it, but unfortunately I couldn't. So um, it just seems to be a long bolt that went from one um, side to the other. We do know that they did have padlocks, um, but it's not something that I've done an awful lot of research into, but mm -hmm. they did have quite complex locking mechanisms. So I would think that it have, as I said to you, that long bolt that went across completely um, the shop shutter, but they also would have had a lock, I presume, on the night door um, for people going in and out of the actual accommodation. So it's quite complex, right. impressively complex. So would the keys have been unique to each door? Um, I don't know, and I don't know if they use, if the criminals used hairpins in those days either. Um, so I would assume they would be. It's not right. just a, a universal lock, nor do they have one of those with a combination on it okay. um, that hadn't been invented. Okay. And would they have been iron? Was it? They would be, as far as I know. Um, the one that uh, the, the bad picture I've looked at does seem to be a bit iron, but I'm not a metallurgist. Okay, now that's brilliant. And let's have a look who did this. Jilly has asked, she's never, and I must admit this is a very good question because I've thought about this many a time. Um, she's never understood how they cleaned the dolia of the food remains. Do you know what? I haven't a clue. Uh, uh, and that is a bit of a problem. Um, I've always suggested that um, they would have just used... Um, dry goods within them the okay. other thing that i would suggest is maybe they would put a sack cloth into it which would help yes. with the cleaning out of it right. which again sounds fairly obvious or you might have put another vessel within but given what's been preserved from the modern shop in pompeii that seems to rubbish all everything that i've said in that the stew seems to be placed within it so they must have been fairly um manky mm. um and the, certainly the larger ones, I think, probably would have been for dried goods. But admittedly, these, they're not something that you can just lift out of a counter. So I think it would have been a problem. I know that sometimes they would have um, uh, coated it in tear to make it sort of a bit more waterproof um, with, um, uh, what's it called, a pitch um, in amphorae. Might have done something similar in the shop counters. But yeah, I do think they're, they're not the most um, straightforward thing in the world to actually use. Okay. Jilly's a little bit worried about this still because she's worried about rotting snails. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe it's, you know, it's an acquired taste, mm -hmm. but in, they don't do rot, rotting snails in Pompeii. I, I looked up in the restaurants actually improved over the years, so you'd be fairly safe. Good, good, lovely. Um, so my questions, and then if anybody else wants to ask some questions, you can unmute yourself and um, ask. I'm very worried about that lovely new um, one they've excavated with those very vibrant colours. Will they now fade or are they going to hack it off and put it in a museum? That I don't know. I think they will, they'll keep it preserved in sight and they probably will look after an awful lot better than has been the case. Um it's, it's because it'll obviously become a, a tourist attraction now so they won't there has been a few other frescoes from domestic dwellings that have been recently uncovered and they're certainly exposed but i don't think they're going to be exposed when i say exposed to the to the to the weather it's like you can see the illustration i showed you there that they have put a, an artificial roof over it right. so i'm hoping that it will be in situ because i'd like to go and see it myself mm. uh, and look at the counter and then maybe look in the dahlia and wondering how the hell they clean those um, <laughs> you're there. Yeah, so um, maybe do a bit of cleaning myself. I don't know. Um, so the truth is, I, I just don't know, but I'm, I'm guessing they would leave them as they are at the moment. It would be expensive to try and remove them. Yeah, because then a couple of the others, they've got like a piece of perspex in front of it. Yeah. I'm not well, sure that helps. Perspex, you know, was a, the wonder thing in the 1960s upwards, wasn't it? Mm. 
<laughs> I'm probably just sweat now. Okay, my other question, which I think you did answer do, as, as we went on, where they look like tiles, the squares, mm. I assume they were paint rather than me thinking they're tiles? Yes, paint. So, it, but, you know, maybe they were trying to mimic tiles in some shape or form um, or a mosaic pattern just to try and make it look a bit more fancy because um, they didn't have tile tiles as we have in the modern sense. But you no, know, it was painted, um, and I think there's quite vibrant colours, as we can see from the shop counter that we were talking about. I'm guessing mm -hmm. the same, and the uh, the facades of these of shops. Excellent. Was there any other questions from anyone? So you can unmute yourselves if you want to any, ask any other questions. Oh, Anne's come up with one. Uh, Anne has asked the shop with the images of gods could be where you brought your home statues and paintings yeah well in, in in such case you know your imagination is probably better than mine actually um we just don't know and that's one of the gifts of the fact that the shop hasn't been fully excavated so we don't know so mm. it might have been that they might have been selling off um various statues of deities for the various temples okay. like like you see in the likes of rome around the vatican who knows <laughs> even now yeah. okay that's brilliant does anybody have any other questions right so thank you very much and i will hopefully speak to ardle again soon on his next um session for us right thank you very much goodbye everyone thank you good night bye